When these police officers mistook my identity and assaulted me, they did not have my rights in mind. Because instead of admitting that they were wrong, they charged me with three felonies. 911 emergency. Oh my God, they're pounding him in the head. <sighs> they're going to kill this man. Yeah, I'd gotten out of work early, walking on the sidewalk on a sunny summer day, going to my internship. I was calling my sister at the time and somewhat distracted by looking at my phone when two men approached me, stepped toward me off the curb and said, hey, you know, hey, who are you? And I, I said, I'm James. Uh, and they asked me, is that your real name? And I said, yes, that's my real name. But one of them stepped behind me, boxed me out and took my wallet out of my back pocket. So I went to run, to flee, and I was tackled and ultimately beaten pretty severely. I was screaming for someone to call the police. Oh, my God. They're beating him up. Like, they're literally assaulting him. When I was being choked, I, I feared for my life, truly. And it was a moment where everything went black. And as far as I know, that is as close as you can get to being dead without being dead. The police came, and then that was when I realized that they weren't muggers, but they were just a police detective and an FBI agent. In this case, the officers were looking for a fugitive with an extremely broad description. James looked absolutely nothing like the photograph the officers had of the fugitive whom they were looking for. Do you have any weapons on you at all? No, sir, I thought they were trying to mug me. I remember being loaded into the back of the ambulance, just being so stricken by what had all had just happened. I was in a great deal of pain when I got to the hospital. And I remember everyone there, the staff, the nurse, even the officer that was in charge of watching me, as I was cuffed to my bed, I remember him loosening the cuffs and telling me that I shouldn't be there. I went directly from the hospital to the jail cell where I was, you know, stripped of my clothing, given a jumpsuit, given a mugshot, spent the night on a cold jail cell crying. I called my parents and made it there as soon as they could to, uh, to bail me out. Hello. This is a prepaid collect call from James, an inmate at Kent County Correctional Facility. Hello. Hey. Um, we're getting screwed. I'm going to prison, I think. No, I don't think that. We're going to get a bondsman and get you out of there. It's 50000 I know. This is bad. This is really bad. After I was released from jail, much to my surprise, the police officers charged me with three violent felonies and I had to go to trial six months later. I spent that whole six months probably the most scared and the most stressed I've ever been in my entire life, having no idea if I'm gonna spend the next 10 years of my life in prison for something that I didn't do. I remember my attorneys telling me, most people don't win against the government and we know that you did nothing wrong, but if they offer you a plea, you should consider taking it. And they did, and I said no. I said, no, I didn't do anything wrong. What happened to James is not an isolated incident. Typically, people just don't hear about them for any number of reasons. In a situation like James's, where a prosecutor brings several serious felony charges against someone, they'll typically take a plea deal to avoid going to trial and potentially spending decades in prison. And once they do that, their ability to go after the officers or hold them accountable for violating the Constitution basically evaporates. When the jury came back, they unanimously acquitted me of all charges. I cried, my family ran towards me. And I remember as I was walking out of the, the courtroom, one of the jurors ran up to me and she gave me a hug and she said, I'm so thankful. She said, I knew the whole time that you did not belong there and these men did terrible things to you. This case illustrates the lack of accountability that takes place when a police officer or an FBI agent violates someone's constitutional rights. One of the main ways that the government avoids accountability for violating the Constitution is through a doctrine that's called qualified immunity. And it says that a government actor is allowed to violate your constitutional rights. You can't do anything about it unless a court has already decided that the actor's specific actions are in fact a constitutional violation. After the assault, I um, dropped out of Grand Valley State University, which I was going to at the time, parts about everything that I've endured is not just the incident 
as it happened when it happened, but all the repercussions since then. Missed job opportunities, but I cannot work federal jobs. For the United States Supreme Court to make things right in James's case and more broadly in constitutional litigation, it needs to revisit this concept of qualified immunity and take a more engaged role in evaluating how difficult it is for plaintiffs to bring lawsuits against government officials who violate the Constitution. James's case is part of IJ's new project on immunity and accountability. Immunity doctrines turn fundamental concepts of American jurisprudence on their head. If citizens must follow the law, the government must also, and that includes following the Constitution. And following the Constitution means officials being held accountable for violating it. The Institute for Justice represents James to ensure that law enforcement officers can't operate above the law and free from the Constitution they were sworn to uphold. A victory for James will set an important precedent through which members of all state and federal joint task forces will be held to account for their actions. They were out of control pounding him. If the United States Supreme Court takes this case and hears it, and it is in our favor, as I firmly believe it should be, I hope that it changes things for the better. I hope that there is accountability for these officers and for the other departments that do this kind of thing and get away with it. One, what's the address of the emergency? Hi. Um, I can hear someone out the back, and I, okay. I'm i not sure if she's having sex or being raped. Give me the address. He heard shots fired, one down. Right, kiddo. You all right? Yeah. Just keep yourself, keep your mouth shut, play nap, to say anything you like. Hop in. Just hop in until it ringer. I'm going off. What do we got? Copy 502 on scene. I have no idea what happened. We just pulled out. Parody. What's going on? Uh, we had that um, the call over here. Someone was screaming in the back. We pulled up here. Uh, we were about ready to just clear and go to another call. She just came up out of nowhere on the side of the thing. And we both got spooked. I had my gun out. I didn't fire and then Nor pulled out and fired. Where is he? Um, he's in the back of this block. Where is he? Two shots from the east. Where is he, Matt? Right here, ma'am. Last Hold on a sec. Where is Newark? He was he's he's with Ringenberg and I Okay. Oh you bought you moved him? Okay. Yes. Okay, you we might need Move move him, yeah. We, we've got somebody in there. Oh, okay. Matt, just go to the end of the block. Hang on, hang on. let me shut this, Matt. Hold on, Matt. 
you going to need somebody with him or not? Yeah. You, Cut Jesse, you go with him. Put him in my car. Just sit with him in my car. Here. I'm going to leave this with you. Your steak doesn't take a regular? No. Who's, does Fahey have, who has newer? Ring or drug. Where? In 510, right down here. Okay, Matt, go with Jesse in my car. I need, I need this whole area. Okay. Do we know where there's a casing? All right, I want, you guys, I'm telling you, I want tape across all that, all the alley. I want that blocked as well. I want anyone walking down here. Yes. Yeah.